let's take a look at this Yahweh guy. It's Jehovah. <laughs> so they pray to Jehovah. This is their main God, Jehovah. That's the name of their religion, Jehovah Witness, right? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's apostrophe S. Jehovah's Witness is the name of their religion. Let's take a look at who this guy really, really is. And I do mean guy. I mean man. Jehovah is not a God that created universes and planets and, and all this kind of stuff. So if you look at the word Yahweh, which as we know is Enlil in the modern day Bible, according to the Sumerian tablets, which predates the Bible by thousands of years, it comes from the word Yahu, which is Assyrian. And Yahweh in German is Jehovah. And so they took the German version of Yahweh. And how do I know this? Because in, during the World War, the Jehovah Witnesses were in full support of Nazi Germany. They even wrote in their personal, uh, in, in their, um, they have a book that the elders, the elders books, the, they have a book that they read that they go by. It's like the elders Bible. And in there, they were making appeasements for Germany and saying and hoping that their mission goes right and the, they, they blessed them with the love of God and everything else on, on what, what they were doing over there in Nazi Germany. And so they took the German, uh, version of Yahweh, which is Jehovah. So Jehovah, which or actually really is uh, Jehovah, is really what it is, Jehovah, because the J really is, uh, it sounds a Y sound. But regardless, it became Jehovah in America. Um, and so Jehovah is actually Enlil. So the power of Yahu in Akkadian, by the time of the return of the Babylonian exiles in the 530s BC, Yahweh was treated as a deity name in its own right. Akkadian grammar was apparently forgotten by those in Israel, and Yahweh is actually mistranslated in the English Hebrew scriptures as Lord. <clears throat> the word Lord is a, coming from a mistranslated word of Yahweh, which is actually a person, not a God. You see how this whole thing is screwed up for the Christians and the Jehovah Witnesses? The whole thing is convoluted garbage. <clears throat> so you see here, uh, you know, to write this image, Hebrew reads from right to left. And transliterated into English, it's Yahweh or Yahweh, Yehovah. But you see, the J is actually supposed to be silent. Um, in America, we've already incorporated the sound of the J, so we call it Jehovah. But it's really Yehovah. So now, according to the Sumerian text, Enki, also known as Satan, so his brother, he's not really Satan, but his brother is really Satan. And Lil is really Satan, but and Lil didn't want to. <clears throat> He didn't want to scare the people and make them think he was the evil one. So what he started doing was blaming everything on his brother, Enki. And he, he, even though Enlil was Satan, the Lord of Eden, he started saying, no, no, he's my brother. He's the one that's actually the evil one. He's Satan, not me. <clears throat> so he can keep the people worshiping him. But according to the Sumerian text, Enki, aka Satan, created man and animals. Uh, he didn't create man and animals in the Sumerian tablets. That's a little bit of a, um, uh, I should have said something like he actually, he, he used genetic techniques uh, to modify existing animals and hominids on this planet. Okay, He didn't make anything from scratch. Nothing was made from scratch here. <clears throat> His brother Enlil created the earth and sky. Now, he didn't create the earth and sky. And this is the part of the mythological version. But what he did was he utilized his understanding of seed planting. And he understood he utilized his understanding of weather patterns and weather control. It's talked about in Sumerian tablets. He would control the weather and dry crops out amongst high multitudes of humans to make them starve to death. So this guy had the power over weather and everything. Okay. Pretty interesting stuff. <clears throat> a rift came between them. So him and his brother started having a lot of arguments, uh, kind of like Cain and Abel from the Bible, Esau and Jacob. And although, uh, Satan, aka Enki, um, was the eldest of the brothers, uh, their father was a chief sumer god. Their father was Anu. That's where you get the term Anunnaki. His, their father's name was Anu. But eventually Yahweh would rule over both earth and his creation. And what happened there, if you look in the Sumerian pantheon, they ruled by a number system. Okay, they had a number system. And even though Enki's number was higher than his brother Enlil, for whatever reason, which is not clear, it never is really said why or how this happened. Uh, maybe Enki relinquished the right to be the king of earth, but Enlil superseded him and became the king of earth and ran the show here for quite some time. 
Each brother was considered an immortal, and therefore, if you wanted to hurt, to hurt the other, you would not fight each other as it would be. It would make no sense. So they wouldn't fight because fighting each other would make no sense because they had the technology to, to, to cure and heal each other. So what they would do is they would attack each other's things like their land, the people that they ruled over, the structures that they built and so forth and so on. That's how they hurt each other. And, 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 and their father got pissed off and said, look, uh, you go to this side, you go over here. You guys stay away from each other and just do your own separate thing. But um, this is where Jehovah comes from. Jehovah is actually coming from the ancient Akkadian and Babylonian cuneiform tablets thousands of years prior to the existence of Jehovah Witnesses. And the person that they're praying to, and I do mean person that they're praying to, is one of the most evil killing rulers of all time. He would kill humans for just for fun. Okay. Later in the Akkadian version of the flood story, recorded in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a famous read, uh, it's the true full story of Noah's Ark. Enlil, who's actually, like I said, Jehovah, actually causes the flood. He actually causes the flood in the cuneiform tablets seeking to annihilate every living thing on earth because he got tired of the humans who were so overpopulated they were making too much noise. He actually says this in the tablets. The humans are making too much noise. I just want to kill them. They're disturbing my sleep. He would kill thousands of humans at a time just because they were too loud for him. This is who Jehovah Witnesses are praying to. Where can you find out more about this guy? The Atrahasis. Okay, let's look at some of the things that, that Jehovah was doing on earth back in the day. Let's see what the let's see what the Jehovah was doing. Now, Yeshua was the name of Jesus. His name was the person they're trying to attribute that fake name to is actually Yeshua, which means Joshua in English, but Yeshua in Middle East, right? This these images are not images that I pulled out. This particular image of Yeshua it comes from Egypt. From the church, the Coptic church in Egypt. Coptic churches existed long before Christianity even existed. And this is the image of Yeshua from uh, the Coptic church. On the right, you see Ethiopian Jews. And you see the Ethiopian Jews have been here for a very, 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 very long time. And you see that these men are actually black men. Now, what does this mean? Does it matter? Is this, is this video about race and color? Actually, it isn't. It's not. It's about education. I want you to know something. I want you to learn something today because you have to understand the foolishness that's been going on on this planet for a couple thousand years, even more than that, but at least for a couple thousand years in, in regards to Yeshua and, uh, and what's, and what, and what, um, dogma has been placed on all of our generations of children down the pipeline, which is which is ridiculously altering the way that we live on this planet and how we think, breathe, eat, sleep, and everything else. So Yeshua is a Middle Eastern man, was a Middle Eastern man. And I do mean man. He was a Middle Eastern man with ties to people that weren't human and they weren't gods either. They were just advanced beings. What's interesting about Yeshua, he was a virgin birth, according to the biblical text. But if you look into some of the older apocrypha texts, you discover that Yeshua grandmother, Yeshua's grandmother, Mary's mother, was also a virgin birth. We have evidence of in vitro fertilization in ancient times to create a specific line that this guy comes out of Yeshua. Was he a real person that existed? Yeah, because I've been to the house that he lived in and I'm going to show it to you in a minute when he was a kid. The Ethiopian Jews is interesting as they have the Torah, they have everything. Jews have lived in Ethiopia for over 2,000 years. It's really closer to 5,000 years, to be honest with you. According to the Ethiopian tradition, one half of the population of the Jewish before Christianity was proclaimed the official religion in the 4th century. The Jews maintained their independence for over 1,000 years in spite of continuous massacres, religious persecution, enslavement, and forced conversions. With the help of modern Portuguese weapons, the Amhara finally conquered the Jews in 1616, enslaving, converting, and killing them, known as falsas, and derog a derogatory name which meaning stranger or exile. Ethiopian Jews could no longer own land or be educated. Today, Jews number in only 25,000, less, less than 1% of the population. 
85% live in Gondar province in the Semian Mountains near Lake Tana. The rest live in Tigre and Wolo provinces. Ethiopian Jews are biblical pre-Rabbanic Jews. Pre-Rabbanic. That means before rabbis existed, they existed. Before rabbis existed, these black Jews already were here. They have the Torah, which is the written law. The Torah came from Ethiopia and then made its way into Europe when the uh, Ashkenazi Jews got their hands on it and the Khazarians. All right. But not the Talmud, which is the oral law. Their language is not Hebrew, but Gies. Their leaders are priests known as Kohanim, rather than rabbis. The, the interpretation of the law e.g. the prohibition against mixing meat and milk. Until recently, Ethiopian Jews practiced animal sacrifice and ritual purification through immersion in water. Otherwise, their religion is the same as Judaism throughout the world, including the observance of the Sabbath and biblical uh, dietary laws. They are religious Zionists. They dream of their re a return to Zion. They call themselves Beta Israel, House of Israel, and have wanted to live in the modern state of Israel since its establishment in 1948. But they're banned from living there because they're black. So they went off and created this white uh, Jewish uh, country, this Zion, and, and left. And the black people that they got the information from on how to live this way, which I still think is not the way for a human being to live. I think that there's a much better way than this these religious dogma. But however put them, ban them from coming here to live there. You, know, you guys stay up here in that little mountain area where you will be, where we, you know, we almost killed you off. You guys just stay over there. And so that's where, where all that comes from. Jesus wasn't uh, a Christian. Okay. Jesus was not a Christian. Christianity didn't exist until Jesus was long gone and dead. But the practice of understanding a Christ, a Christ consciousness existed. And understanding what it meant to ascend to a higher level of consciousness, they called it Christ consciousness. It's an ancient text in deep antiquity. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus, or really his name is Yeshua, is just one of many teachers of Christ's knowledge and wisdom. Okay. This image here is from Egypt. It's from the, uh, the Coptic Museum. Okay. This is from the Coptic Museum. This is a very, very old image of Yeshua, not Asus, not Hail Zeus, but Yeshua. OK, uh, giving a lesson and talking to people, possibly his disciples on the right and and uh, and possibly uh, people that he's speaking to on the left right, or, or vice versa, depending on which angle you're looking at this. However, what's interesting is this man did teach some amazing things and he learned some amazing things. When he disappeared out of the Bible at the age of 12, he went to Egypt. OK, that's where he went. He went to Egypt. This is where he went. This is where he lived right here in this room. You're looking at the actual room, which is now a shrine. This is a shrine now. He actually lived, slept, ate in this area right here, which has now been turned into a Coptic church. They built up on the around. It, it used to be like considered like a it was like a cave here. It was like a, 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 a shelter, a, a cave made into a shelter. Now it's an actual um, Coptic church. And you can come in the front door and walk down to this crypt that's there as a, as a, um, uh, you know, pres as being preserved in, re in recognition or re a memory of Yeshua. Um, his mother was here as well, Mary, right? What did he do here? He came here to learn the Egyptian mysteries. From who? Thoth. Thoth, the Atlantean priest king who ruled over the land of Kem for 14,000 years. That's not Billy telling you this. That's the Egyptian hieroglyphs telling you this. It's not all coming off the top of my head. That's the Egyptian hieroglyphs telling you this, the language of light. And so then he leaves out of here as he gets a little bit older and he goes on a journey to Tibet, which has been confirmed by the Dalai Lama. I had a whole video about this with uh, Robert Grant. He went to Tibet, well account, well known account of him in Tibet, learning Reiki healing, Qigong, healing with the hands, energy moving through the body, meditation, all of that. After he became a master of that, he headed down into India where he learned the mystic arts. 
and reincarnation. And then he taught reincarnation all the way back down into Egypt. Then the Bible picks up and says, I call him when he's 32. I called my son out of Egypt. That's where the Bible picks up. I called my son out of Egypt. And so then he, he returns to Jerusalem coming in on the back of a donkey, right? That's where it picks up. That's the next scene. So, but this exists. And this is a well-known account that the records are clear. The evidence is clear. This is where he actually lived and walked and lived among people every single day as the boy grew into a man, not a God. We are all God. They try to tell you all that. They try to tell you, ye are gods. We are all God walking in the flesh. We're a fractal of the universal consciousness that that is the energy that creates this entire universe. Every single one of us is God. So anyway, this is where Yeshua actually lived. And so what does this come down to? Time walks through men, but God's walk through time. So this brings me into the next thing here. Well, if that ain't, if he's not Jesus, then who is Jesus? Let's have a look. Zeus, in ancient Greek religion, is the chief deity of the Pantheon, a sky and weather god who was identical with the Roman god Jupiter. His name may be related to that of the sky god Dias of the ancient Hindu Rigveda. Zeus and uh, Zeus was regarded as the sender of thunder and lightning, rain and winds, and his traditional weapon was the thunderbolt, which is he's holding in his hand here, the depiction of him with the thunderbolt. He was called the father, i.e. the ruler and protector of both gods and men. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why um, Alexander the Great felt he had the right to go and take over the world is because he said that he was the offspring. His father wasn't a human, but his father was actually Zeus. And then he was told that he was half human and half uh, Anunnaki because Zeus was actually the Anunnaki named in Lil, which we'll go into. And uh, in the account of uh, Alexander the Great, which is a whole other podcast to talk about, as he went into countries to take over and destroy and subjugate the people to his new system, there would be UFOs flying overhead, helping him to win these battles. And this is in his own accord, his own record, his own account, not a made up account by Billy Carson, an historical account that anybody can look up. And it has something to do with this guy. So Zeus, big time, big name, Zeus. Hmm. Keep that in mind. According to a, uh, a Cretan myth that was later adopted by the Greeks, Cronus, king of the Titans, upon learning that one of his children was fated to dethrone him, swallowed his children as soon as they were born. But Rhea, his wife, saved the infant Zeus by substituting a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes for a Cronus to swallow and hiding Zeus in the cave on Crete. Sounds like the Moses story, doesn't it? There he was nursed by the nymph uh, Amalthea and guarded by the Curites, which were, who were young warriors, who clashed their weapons to disguise the baby's cries. After Zeus grew to manhood, he led a revolt against Titans and succeeded in dethroning Cronus, perhaps with the assistance of his brothers Hades and Poseidon, with whom he then divided dominion over the world. Sounds like a myth, but there's a lot of truth in this story. The story is uh, part myth, part truth. And this guy, this entity, this being, Zeus, was actually a real person. If you go back into the Babylonian cuneiform Sumerian tablets, you discover that Zeus is actually Enlil. Enlil is Zeus in Babylonian. This is thousands of years prior to the Greeks even having this guy show up. Poseidon, a.k.a. Neptune, Lord of the sea, wields a trident. When angered, he can cause earthquakes and turbulent waters. And when uh, appropriated properly, he can prevent or calm the same. He is associated with the horses and bulls as well. Okay. Always have, we always hear talk in the ancient text about the bull of heaven. They're talking about Enlil. This guy was evil. Enlil was so evil. When you look into the ancient Sumerian tablets, you find that when humans 
were populating the earth at a high speed, which he liked because he needed them as slaves. When they got too noisy, he would order them. This is carved in stone, guys. He would order them to be slaughtered in mass. Just call them, call them, call the humans. They're too noisy. Kill them off. He would put a chemical on their crops to dry the crops out so they would, wouldn't be able to harvest and would starve to death. That way he can keep control of the, um, of the population, population control. He would spray something in the air over their cities to kill massive amounts of them at a time. Sounds like chemtrails in ancient times. Chemtrails ain't new. They were already doing this. This is Zeus. And why am I talking about this guy? Zeus, a.k.a. Enlil in ancient texts, because Enlil was also the god of Genesis that came into the garden and noticed that uh, Adam and Eve had put clothes on and they had, were aware of consciously aware of who they were and that they weren't animals, that they were really sentient beings. And he was pissed off about that. In the ancient text, he's known as Satan, the Lord of Eden. This guy is Satan, the devil himself. OK, but he pretends to be a god. and He calls himself Yahweh in the modern day Bible. But let's dig a little deeper into this. So, uh, Zeus, why am I bringing this up? Let's look a little deeper into some more of this ancient text. Here goes another depiction of him. You see him holding the same type of object in his hand here. This is even uh, older. Isus, the Celtic lord or master, powerful Celtic deity, one of three mentioned by the Roman poet Lucan in the first century A.D., the other two were uh, Tyrannus, which is Thunderer, and Tukates, which is God of the people. This is your Holy Trinity. This, were, this is where the Holy Trinity actually originated from. This is where your Holy Trinity originated from. I, I shouldn't say originated. It's one of the Holy Trinities that this version of it made it into the biblical text. Esus has had, he had victims. This guy was pretty brutal. Because we're talking about the same guy that I just told you about, Zeus, a.k.a. Enlil. Esus' victims, according uh, according to later co uh, commentators, were sacrificed by being ritually stabbed and hung from trees. Hung from trees? Sound like the slavery times to me. Sound like the same thing that happened for the last 400 years in America. Hung from trees. Hung from trees, a relief of the, uh, from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris portrays him as a bent woodman cutting a branch from a willow tree. That's mm, interesting. It always has the same exact form. This is related in relief to uh, Trier Gur associated with him, the sacred bull, and his accompanying cranes or egrets. Human victims were sacrificed to Isus by being tied to a tree and flogged to death. And so this is the guy that uh, name much later evolved into Jesus. So this is why I'm taking you on this on this trail. Isus, Celtic Lord, Lord, your Lord God, or Master, which he's also been known as, powerful deity, right? Who comes with his own trinity and is brutal, a brutal killing murderer. And so that is not actually... Jesus that you think of. Again, you've been praying to and calling on and and using the word cymatic frequency. Words are cymatic frequencies. When you utter them, you create vibrations in space time that alter the, your reality in this dimension. And so every time you call on the name of Jesus, you're calling on Enlil, Zeus, aka Isus. You're calling on a brutal murdering killer. And you're also then looking at the face of a guy who was also a brutal, brutal murderer, killer, incest, uh, power hungry dude. And these are the people that you inadvertently are calling on and praying to. The Greek savior Zeus in time became the word Isus, which was further corrupted into Jesus in English. Yeah, let me say that again to you guys. The Greeks savior was Zeus. That was their savior. They prayed to Zeus. The word Isus, see, J didn't exist yet. J didn't exist until 1524. So if I go back to the story of Caesar Borgia, you'll find out he was in the 1400s when he ordered Leonardo da Vinci to, uh, to do his image, create him in the image of Jesus. The name wasn't Jesus. It was Isus. 
without a J. Guess why, guys? Because the J didn't even exist yet. J didn't exist and wasn't pronounced until 1524. How did J get a sound? Both I and J were used interchangeably by scribes to express the sound of both the vowel and the consonant. It wasn't until 1524 when Gian Giorgio Tresino, an Italian Renaissance grammarian known as the father of the letter J, made a clear distinction between the two sounds. And then J was precariously added to Isus, changing it to Jesus, evolving over time into Jesus. So what does it mean when you say Jesus, you're saying hail Zeus. That's what you're saying. You're saying hail to Zeus. And there will be Bible study websites that will try to deny this on Google. They'll try to deny that this. No, that's not what it means and blah, blah, blah. But when you dig deep into the text and you dig deep into real ancient history and go and get the real ancient books and get the Greek books out and get the Latin books out. All of a sudden you go, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we've been saying hail Zeus this whole damn time. People just turn around, Jesus! And they're calling on Zeus. They're calling on Zeus, and in their mind, they got an image of this white guy who was a killer and an ancestor. <laughs> and, 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 and at the same time, the entity, Zeus himself, is one of the most brutal killing, murdering slave owners in the world, in the history of the world. This is why this this religion has got to come to an end because it's a farce. It's an absolute farce. And you see the Ethiopian Jews have been here for a very, 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 very long time. And you see that these men are actually black men. Now, what does this mean? Does it matter? Is this, is this video about race and color? Actually, it isn't. It's not. It's about education. I want you to know something. I want you to learn something today because you have to understand the foolishness that's been going on on this planet for a couple thousand years, even more than that, but at least for a couple thousand years in, in regards to Yeshua and what's and what and what um, dogma has been placed on all of our generations of children down the pipeline, which is which is ridiculously altering the way that we live on this planet and how we think, breathe, eat, sleep and everything else. So Yeshua is a Middle Eastern man, was a Middle Eastern man. And I do mean man. He was a Middle Eastern man with ties to people that weren't human and they weren't gods either. They were just advanced beings. It was interesting about Yeshua. He was a virgin birth, according to the biblical text. But if you look into some of the older Apocrypha texts, you discover that Yeshua grandmother, Yeshua's grandmother, Mary's mother, was also a virgin birth. We have evidence of in vitro fertilization in ancient times to create a specific line that this guy comes out of Yeshua. Was he a real person that existed? Yeah, because I've been to the house that he lived in. And this image here is from Egypt. It's from the, uh, the Coptic Museum. This is from the Coptic Museum. This is a very, very old image of Yeshua, not Asus, not Hail Zeus, but Yeshua uh, giving a lesson and talking to people, possibly his disciples on the right and, and, uh, and possibly uh, people that he's speaking to on the left. Right, or vice versa, depending on which angle you're looking at this. What's interesting is this man did teach some amazing things and he learned some amazing things. When he disappeared out of the Bible at the age of 12, he went to Egypt. OK, that's where he went. He went to Egypt. Yeshua was the name of Jesus. His name was the person they're trying to attribute that fake name to is actually Yeshua, which means Joshua in English. But Yeshua in the Middle East, right? And please, guys, don't fight over the race stuff. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. If, if, if a black person wants to know about ancient history to find out if people are black in ancient history, let them find out. Like, just don't put, don't, don't do it to us. Just relax, okay? I don't like it when people start to go, you know, you shouldn't be asking about race. No, we should be because we need to know. You got to remember that black people's entire ancient past have been robbed and stolen away. We don't know anything about ourselves. We're one of the very few races of people on this planet that are completely lost. You got to realize that we don't know. We don't know who we are. We don't know anything. We've been our, our history has been completely erased and modified and changed, which has a direct effect on our consciousness. So one, it's like if you were adopted and then you you have a quest, you have this inner inner yearning to find out who was your mom, who was your dad. And people spend their entire lives 
researching and trying to trace and track down who their original parents were. It's just yearning inside. So if you hear a black person asking questions about were these people black or were they black pharaohs or whatever, don't chastise them. Don't get angry at them. Don't write, you know, we were all the same race. Yeah, we know that we're all the same race. I mean, that's common sense. But what we're trying to say is we're trying to get down to understand, like, who we are. Where do we come from? What, what are we connected to? Because if you look at the most chastised and most abandoned and most abused people on the planet Earth, unfortunately, right now, it's black people. For thousands of years, it's been this way. And so um, people are just trying to reconnect to find, is there any semblance of anything in ancient history that had any honor and dignity? Or have we always been beat down and downtrodden our entire, our entire existence? That's an important question to ask, don't you think? Just for the sights, but just for the psyche, just so people can understand, like, man, are we always in this situation like this? Have we always been the worst people on the planet in terms of the way we've been treated? Or was there a golden era where we had, you know, we had a, t a time that we um, we had good things going on and we and we lived good and people didn't abuse us and uh, and, and kick us and, and shoot us in the back of our heads. I think that's a real simple. I think that's real honest and, and a simple question to, to be wanting to know. I mean, it's not even like a stretch to be like, hey, were there any black people back? I want to know, too. That's why I did the, the black, the hidden black queens and kings of Egypt, the ancient land of Kim. People need to know that. They just need to know to feel to feel connected to something. You know, it's it's a natural human instinct to want to know where you came from and what you're connected to. What was your past like? What was it like back then? Um, and so that's why I do these videos. It ain't about black people are better than white people and all this other kind of stuff. It's just to to educate and bring forth information that might bring some closure or some confirmation to some people to make them feel like, wow, you know, OK. It's good to know that it wasn't always the way it is right now. OK, so when black people ask about their ancient history, please don't 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 say don't comment against them. Please don't don't do it. Don't do it. And we need to also accept a lot of the things that we did do in the past that were wrong. So a lot of people get get real happy when they hear, oh, man, yeah, you know, we were all Jesus was black. And to be honest with you. There were a lot of black people in the, in the in this area. Africa extended far past where it is now. That that you can't go by the invisible lines that people put on continents, and it extended all the way up until what we call the Middle Eastern area. But if you look at a lot of these biblical texts and tales, you find that people enslaved people. Hebrews enslaved other Hebrews had their own slaves. I'm against slavery of any type. I'm against slavery of any race of people. I'm against slavery. Period. I'm against, if an animal knew how to enslave another animal, I'm against that. I'm against slavery, period. So when you own the, when you try to own up to, you know, all this, yeah, yeah, it was us. Well, own up to all of it too. The thing is to not get excited about what color, what skin color somebody was. The thing is to get excited about learning the truth about the ancient past. Could both and Jesus, aka Yeshua, be the same person? Or could he have learned from so the Atlantino you know, Tahuti, right? Mm. Same person. In my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, mm. I literally break down verses from the Bible and verses from the Emerald Tablets, and I put them side by side. Mm. And as you go down, you begin to say, wait a minute. <laughs> if this is ancient text, and this is only 2,000 years old, not, it's not even 2,000. 2,000 years old is a farce because we know the Bible was written between 100 AD to 900 AD by Phoenicians, followers of Tahuti. <laughs> so if we know that, then we have to say which comes first, the chicken or the egg. If the compendium of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth were written 36 to 38,000 years ago, and then we have Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus, saying the same thing, right? Thousands and thousands of years later, he either is Tahuti or he learned from him. And that's where I go into, the, into my lecture where I'm talking about where did Jesus go when he disappeared from the Bible? In the Bible, he's gone. Age of 12, poof, he's gone. Where did he go? He goes to Egypt. And when I take people on these grand tours of Egypt, I take them to the place where Jesus actually slept, where he lived for some time in Coptic Cairo. The bed that he slept in is a shrine that's still there till this very day and is guarded. And so he went to Egypt. Why did he go to Egypt? He went there to learn the Egyptian mysteries. From who? Tahuti. He was a student of Tahuti. Right. So now when we say, could he either be Tahuti or as a student of Tahuti? 
Well, that's a much deeper conversation. I might be a whole other podcast because this guy was such a wizard and magician. He had he had come back and incarnated at will over 10,000 lives, right, according to the Emerald Tablets, over the course of 100,000 years. Could he have gotten bored with that and said, you know, I want to come through a womb of a woman and come out and see life as a human being and regain all my memory? So it's a possibility. But either way, he disappears out of the Bible at the age of 12. He goes to, to uh, Egypt. He learns the Egyptian mysteries. Then there's a record of him going throughout Egypt into Nubia and then even leaving there and going to Tibet. In Tibet, he learned how to heal with his hands. He learned the art of Qigong, Reiki, and all these other healing modalities through moving energy through the body. So he became a healer. Again, something that would be considered to be magic-like. And then from there, and that was confirmed by the Dalai Lama, by the way. Then he moved from there down into India, learning the mystic arts. Again, more, quote-unquote, magic. And from there, teaching reincarnation all the way back to Egypt. And then from there, the Bible picks back up at the age of 32. He says, I call, God says, I call my son out of Egypt. And then the next thing you know, he appears at the age of 32, riding in on the back of a, a donkey into Jerusalem. So that's the cycle. So this this Jesus that people are worshiping all over the world, this guy was a student of the Egyptian mysteries, of Tibetan mysteries, mm -hmm. and Indian mysteries. <laughs> he learned magic, mystic arts, energy movement, all cymatic frequencies, Woo. and then he came back to teach the people. So here in this image you see on the left, you see Caesar Borgia. Caesar Borgia, however you want to pronounce it. And on the right, you see what's been known as the depiction of Jesus Christ, which is now a global image. I'm going to teach you of the falsehoods of this image, and I'm going to go kind of deep into it as well. So false images of Jesus, the Renaissance depiction of Christ as a handsome, thin faced white man with a thin beard is based on the likeness of Cesare Borgia and the second son of Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. Pope Alexander VI. OK. This is getting into the papacy. Now, this is actually uh, right at the era. This is the era of the beginning of the papal inquisitions, by the way, which in which they, the popes ordered the death of over 80 million people over the course of 700 years to get them to believe in their religion and Jesus. Cesare Borgia was born in 1475 and became a cardinal in the Catholic Church at the age of 18. This is the this is the guy that you're praying to. So when you are a Christian person and you believe in the uh, in the uh, biblical Jesus and you're calling on the name of Jesus and believing in Jesus and everything else. And you're looking at that image of Jesus in your church and you're dropping onto your knees and crying and weeping all your tears. This is the guy that you're actually praying to and crying to. Not the real person at all. Let me tell you how brutal this guy was. OK, realizing there was no power in a cardinalship, he resigned. He murdered his older brother, Giovanni, in 1497, and Cesare assumed his role as captain of the general of military forces of the papacy. So what he did was he killed his brother because his brother was running the military. He was like, man, his brother got my, my brother got power. I don't have any power. I'm just a, a lowly cardinal, you know, guiding the sheep. So he said to himself, hmm, if I kill my brother, then I can take over his job. He ain't trying to know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot better ways to try to get the job, but I guess he thought killing him would have been the easiest way. So he was successful in doing that. He killed his brother. It's well documented. Killed his brother. That's what the title of this whole, this whole thing is. This guy kills his brother. He quickly launched a military campaign to conquer all of Italy. What does that mean? What would a Pope's military be doing conquering other countries? They're bringing the gospel. When they tell you they're coming to your country to bring Jesus and the Holy Bible with them in the gospel, the good news, what they mean is they're coming to kill you and destroy you and then subjugate your offspring and make them speak your, their language and make them worship their God. That's exactly what it means. He quickly launched a military campaign to conquer all of Italy. During his brutal reign as captain general, he influenced depictions of Jesus to resemble his own likeness. He said, man, this Jesus here. This guy's got a little bit of power over these people. I want his power, too. You see, this guy's an energy vampire. He's an energy vampire. 
He says, I want that power. This military is not enough. I'm killing a lot of people. But you know what? I want more power than this. I want to be in the people's minds. Every time they think about something I want to, to pray to or think about holy, I want them to be looking at me. So he says, you know what? Hmm. I'm going to get Leonardo da Vinci to create this for me. So he got Leonardo da Vinci to uh, and assign him to paint the Christ on a model of Caesar Borgia. And that imprint and that first one became the model for all Jesus Christ images moving forward in time. This is how you can time travel. This guy time travel with one conscious thought by ordering uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci to paint his image as the image of Christ and make it known that this from, from hence, from this day forward, I am the Christ. This is the Christ. What he did was he traveled in time into the future. He created a ripple in space time that traveled into the future. And right now, your mom and your dad, and your grandparents and some of you listening right now, drop into your knees, praying to this evil dude. Don't even know it. The Borgia family is known for incest. This is his sister, Lucrezia. You may notice her if you play video games. There's a video game. I forget the name of the oh, uh, Creed, the movie, the, the, the video game called Creed, something Creed. You have uh, Caesar Borgia and his sister, Lucrezia, in the video game kissing. So, they, you know, they've encoded it into the video games. So the Borgia family is known for incest, intrigue, and murder. And stories, I spelled that wrong, stories have been told of them since they themselves walked the hallways of the Apostolic Palace. In particular, vicious rumors and slanderous tales have stuck to the names of the two members of the infamous Borgia family, Cesare and Lucrezia, brother and sister of the histories of history's most notorious family. So this brings me into the next thing here. Well, if that ain't, if he's not Jesus, then who is Jesus? Let's have a look. Zeus in ancient Greek religion is the chief deity of the pantheon. Zeus and uh, Zeus was regarded as the sender of thunder and lightning, rain and winds. And his traditional weapon was the thunderbolt, which is he's holding in his hand here. The depiction of him with the thunderbolt. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why um, Alexander the Great felt he had the right to go and take over the world is because he said that he was the offspring. His father wasn't a human, but his father was actually Zeus. And then he was told that he was half human and half uh, Anunnaki because Zeus was actually the Anunnaki named in Lil, which we'll go into. Uh, in the account of uh, Alexander the Great, which is a whole other podcast to talk about, as he went into countries to take over and destroy and subjugate the people to his new system, there would be UFOs flying overhead, helping him to win these battles. And this is in his own accord, his own record, his own account, not a made up account by Billy Carson, an historical account. And it has something to do with this guy. And this guy, this entity, this being, Zeus, was actually a real person. If you go back into the Babylonian cuneiform Sumerian tablets, you discover that Zeus is actually Enlil. Enlil is Zeus in Babylonian. This is thousands of years prior to the Greeks even having this guy show up. They're talking about Enlil. This guy was evil. Enlil was so evil, when you look into the ancient Sumerian tablets, you find that when humans were populating the earth at a high speed, which he liked because he needed them as slaves, when they got too noisy, he would order them. This is carved in stone, guys. He would order them to be slaughtered in mass. Just call them, call them, call the humans. They're too noisy. Kill them off. He would put a chemical on their crops to dry the crops out so they would, wouldn't be able to harvest and would starve to death. That way he can keep control of the, um, of the population, population control. He would spray something in the air over their cities to kill massive amounts of them at a time. Sounds like chemtrails in ancient times. Chemtrails ain't new. They were already doing this. This is Zeus. And why am I talking about this guy? Zeus, a.k.a. Enlil in ancient texts, because Enlil was also the god of Genesis that came into the garden and noticed that uh, Adam and Eve had put clothes on and they had, were aware of consciously aware of who they were and that they weren't animals, that they were really sentient beings. And he was pissed off about that. In the ancient text, he's known as Satan, the Lord of Eden. This guy is Satan, the devil himself. OK, but he pretends to be a god and he calls himself Yahweh in the modern day Bible. Esus has had he had victims. This guy was pretty brutal because we're talking about the same guy that I just told you about, Zeus, aka and Lil. Esus victims, according uh, according to later co uh, commentators, 
were sacrificed by being ritually stabbed and hung from trees. Hung from trees sound like the slavery times to me. Sound like the same thing that happened for the last 400 years in America, hung from trees. And so this is the guy name much later evolved into Jesus. And so every time you call on the name of Jesus, you're calling on Enlil, Zeus, AKA Isus. You're calling on a brutal murdering killer. And you're also then looking at the face of a guy who was also a brutal, brutal murderer, killer, incest, uh, power hungry dude. And these are the people that you inadvertently are calling on and praying to. The Greek savior Zeus in time became the word Isus, which was further corrupted into Jesus in English. Yeah, let me say that again to you guys. The Greeks savior was Zeus. That was their savior. They prayed to Zeus. The word Isus, see, J didn't exist yet. J didn't exist until 1524. So if I go back to the story of Caesar Borgia, you'll find out he was in the 1400s when he ordered Leonardo da Vinci to, uh, to do his image, create him in the image of Jesus. The name wasn't Jesus. It was Isus without a J. Guess why, guys? Because the J didn't even exist yet. J didn't exist and wasn't pronounced until 1524. So what does it mean when you say Jesus? You're saying hail Zeus and they're calling on Zeus. They're calling on Zeus. And in their mind, they got an image of this white guy who was a killer and an ancestor. And, 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 and at the same time, the entity Zeus himself is one of the most brutal killing, murdering slave owners in the world, in the history of the world. This is why this, this religion has got to come to an end because it's a farce. It's an absolute farce. Wow, this whole time we've been praying to this Pope and then at the same time we're praying to this Pope, this image is burnt into our, literally burnt into our brain to the point where when you hear Jesus, you instantly see that face. So we're, 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 we, this, this guy's taking up real estate in all the brains of 8 billion people on planet Earth. And at the same time that you see that face, you're calling a name that has nothing to do with that face. It's got a tie back to an ancient Anunnaki being named Enlil that was a brutal enslaving murderer on this planet and put in the systems in place that we still have today, including the police system, the bicameral Congress, all that was started by Enlil. Even he, he even started the way that uh, city grids are laid out. He said to his sister in one of the tablets, to Ninma, he said to Ninma, this plan I have on this planet is to last for all time. This guy didn't say this should last for a couple hundred years. This guy said my plan for what I'm going to do to this planet is going to last for all time. That's etched in stone. And guess what, guys? The evidence of that is still all around us. Because no matter what neighborhood I go to, there's a thousand churches in every neighborhood. And the more brutal the neighborhood is, if I go to my, I went to my old neighborhood actually about three months ago, took Elizabeth down there. There were, I think it was 32 churches in a eight square mile area. 32, in that area, in that neighborhood, people are getting shot and killed, stabbed and drugged out and dying from overdoses and houses broken into the crime is through the roof every single day. My elementary school has a 20 foot barbed wire fence around it. And there's a church right around the next corner. You see what I'm saying? What's going on here? You need to understand that these images that they put out, this programming that they put out is fake. They want you to believe that this Yeshua was sent here from heaven by some magical white deity with a white robe on and a magic wand. And then the guy with the magic wand and the white robe said, you know what? These people, I know I'm omnipotent and I'm omniscient and I know everything, but I just can't seem to figure out how to make these people behave. So what I'll do is I'll sacrifice, I'll kill my own son and that'll teach him. Come on, man. For real. That, that will be, that's what, that's what we, and then we read, and then we're in school, we're told that the Greeks have mythology and then people go to Bible study the same night. I, come on. For real. Are we, are we being for real here? Come on, guys. We got to stop. <laughs> we got to stop, man. We got to stop this foolishness. And if you think you can call on Yeshua, you're just calling on a man. He told you the power is within you. And the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. 
He talking. He saying, "Hey, man." He saying the same thing I'm telling you guys. Hey, man, it's all on you now. You gotta come, and you gotta do. He said, "You gotta do better works than me." So where's your? Why are you not living in your power? Why are you not living in your power? Jesus wasn't uh, a Christian. Okay, Jesus was not a Christian. Christianity didn't exist until Jesus was long gone and dead. But the practice of understanding a Christ, a Christ consciousness existed and understanding what it meant to ascend to a higher level of consciousness. They called it Christ consciousness. It's an ancient text in deep antiquity. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus, or really his name is Yeshua, is just one of many teachers of Christ's knowledge and wisdom. Okay? Yeshua was never sacrificed. In the Sinai Bible, which predates the King James Bible by almost a thousand years, Yeshua was never sacrificed. Not only that, there's close to 10,000 mistranslations between the two Bibles. The King James Bible is heavily, 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 heavily curated information. You want to get closer to the source, you got to get to the Ethiopian Bible, which includes the, the, the book of Enoch. That's the only Bible in the world that includes the book of the full book of Enoch is in the Ethiopian Bible. And uh, this book has been so altered and so played with that the information is skewed and set up in a way which pure neuroscience. And when I mean whoever these people that put this together, these people had to be neuroscientists. This is why I'm telling you in my previous video from last week. Could the God of the Bible really be Satan? Well, the answer is yes. And the answer is, this is the person and him and his other, his nephew, Amin Ra, curated this thing from the very beginning, how they wanted it to play out. So they can make you think that they were going to their demise. Meanwhile, they were leading you to your own demise, taking you completely off course and off track as to what the real meaning of the text actually is by mixing a lot of truth with a little bit of lies, sprinkling it right down in there with some fabrication. Hell was added to the Bible by the Roman Catholic Church. Lake of Fire was added to the Bible in the 1600s, Roman Catholic Church. The uh, rapture was added to the Bible in 1835 by William James Darby, okay? Added to the Bible. Then later became, it was a cliff note originally, a suggestion that he came up with on his own. But when some pastors had saw how much power it had over the people, it later made it into the canonized text. And now you got people running around talking about the Lord is coming to rapture me and take me back on this cloud and all this crazy stuff. That's just fabrication, fabricated information that you didn't know about. Doesn't exist. Heaven is here and hell is here. They're both in the same location. And what is your job and mission on this earth? According to what I read in the Bible, from what I understand to be factual information, your mission is to bring heaven to earth. Your mission is to create a divine outlook on what you think life is supposed to be and what it should look like and how people should love one another and how we should be all prosperous and how we can utilize our knowledge and wisdom and combine that with our technology and everything else that we've learned and love for animals and everything else and then how we can then project that consciously from a multi-dimensional platform of thought into a three-dimensional reality and right now until we figure that out we're in hell what these people don't realize is the voice that they're hearing in their head is their own voice talking to their own self. When you reach a higher level of consciousness, that voice, it starts to change. It don't stay the same. When you start off in a religious mind, it sounds like some outside, deep, echoing, bellowing voice giving you commands. As you become more and more conscious, the voice morphs, and then the next thing you know, it's your own voice. And when you get to the point that you hear your own voice in your own head talking to you, because remember, you're not here. That's when you've began to ascend to a higher level. Unfortunately, most religious people don't know one less than less than one tenth of one percent of what they're supposed to know about their own religion. But yet and still, they're looking for this to take them into eternity. Now, keep in mind, this is not about bashing religion. This is about exposing real truths. This is about giving you information that will make you begin to ask questions and then begin to seek answers to those questions. All right. 
And as I usually do, I always bring my receipts. I always bring my receipts. Very important. We're talking about a lot of contradictions. You see, one of the biggest problems that I have with religious beliefs, man exists both as a being of light and also as a matter, according to actual peer-reviewed science, not according to Billy Carson. So you can't say, oh, this guy's just making this stuff up. The person that you are saying is God in here is not God, is not the creator of the universe. One of the things that uh, they like to say in church, God is good all the time. He's the same all the time. He's never changing. He's never changing. That's the biggest statement that preachers push on you from the pulpit. God is good all the time. He's the same. In the beginning, he's the same as he is now today. He's never changed. All the time. Same all the time. Never changed. Well, let's look at what this biblical text has to say. Ephesians 6, 5. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. You are an all-knowing, all-loving God, creator of a universe, and literally can create planets with just spoken word. You can't say, I don't want slavery to ever exist in my universe. I cast it out of my universe. The thought will never appear in anyone's mind. You can't do that. They're trying to say that this thing was orchestrated by the God that created the universe. No. No, it's much deeper and darker than that. If you don't believe me, watch my video that I have on the same YouTube channel. Could the God of the Bible be Satan? And then digest that one. Fear and love don't really go together. They just don't go together. Those two things don't go together. God is good all the time. He never changes, right? Never change. Maybe he doesn't because guess what? He, again, adding gender to a, to a creator of the universe, again, more male energy, more masculine energy, more male dominance. Look what men have done to this planet. We turned this thing into a damn ghetto. Again, why would Christians want to be af afraid and fearful of damnation and, and hate and hatred and, and attack from their own creator who's all-knowing and all-loving? They're only doing it because they want to save their ass. Just in case this hell and lake of fire, is actually, it actually exists. And if it exists, I played it safe. White people didn't invent no damn slavery. Because these people who, who were doing this foolishness were not white. Romans 6.16. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. 1 Corinthians 7, 22. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. I can still be a slave, but as long as I'm calling on the Lord and believing in the Lord, I'm the slave in the physical body, but my mind can be free, but my body can never be free. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. Oh, why, thank you. <laughs> I can now be a slave of Christ as well. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're so kind. If you really truly in your heart believe that sincerely, then you've been fooled to the highest level. I believe that there's a God and I believe that there's a creator of this universe because the science proves that we're living in a creation. The science proves that we ourselves are a creation. However, the one in this book, that ain't it. Romans 14, 9. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both dead and the living. All right. So now we're going into where people are talking about this return of Jesus. But nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus is coming back. It keeps mentioning Christ. Jesus didn't say he was going to return. He said the Christ would return. What is the Christ? When you look into, there's been many Christ on this planet. When you look into what a Christ is, it's a level of consciousness. You see, there's some good stuff in the Bible, but what they did was they took the good stuff and they overrode it with a lot of bad stuff, a lot of darkness, a lot of manipulation and agenda, and a lot of propaganda. You got to be able to discern what's good and what's bad. 
What is being born again? Being born again is rising up to a higher level of consciousness and looking back on your previous thought process and realizing that you've grown consciously. That's being born again. Not having some pastor douse you in the ocean or throw you in a bathtub or splash water on your baby. Your baby don't even know what the, what the hell's going on. You didn't bless any baby. You didn't do anything positive for that kid. All you did was give the kid some trauma, PTSD. Kid gonna be afraid to go swimming now because you just splashed the kid and dashed him hardcore into the into the little tub, and now this kid is gonna be afraid to go swimming. That's what you did. You just gave him PTSD. Nothing else. You didn't give him no blessings. Being born again is rising in consciousness. Christ consciousness is the highest level. The ancient sages knew this. Jesus Christ was not the first Christ. There was many Christ before Yeshua the Christ. It's a level of thinking and understanding. It has nothing to do with this foolishness that you've been preached and taught. Not one iota. Not none of it. Period. Heaven and hell is a state of mind. Heaven and hell is a state of mind, and these are your temples. You got to call on the name of Jesus so that you can be saved, and you can be born again, and you can die and go to heaven. But then here's the other contradiction if you... Now, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm believing and walking in Christ and been calling on the name of Jesus, I'm going to be raptured up into heaven. I'm never going to have to die. So am I going to die or do I not got to die? The Bible says you got to die to begin to enter the gates. And then somewhere else it says you don't have to die to enter the gates. Well, which one is it? The rapture doctrine. John Nelson Darby. He added that to the Bible in 1827. The rapture doctrine was added to the Bible as a cliff note. Pastor saw it as a positive thing that can that can put fear in the people and, and energize the people and can bring in a lot of money. So they made it part of the scripture, became part of the doctrine, but it was a cliff note originally by John Nelson Darby, 1827. There is no rapture. If you've been sitting around kicking your feet up, watching the world burn, thinking, oh, the infidels will be burning in this Oh, unlimited eternal fire, and I'm just going to be swept away off this planet, so I'm not going to do anything down here. I'm not going to put any of my energy into these people. I'm just going to ask for forgiveness and wait for this God to come sweep me away into this magical heaven. You missed the boat. You missed the message. You're so far off, you don't even know what is, what is up and what is down. There's no rapture. There's no magical rapture coming to snatch your body, your spirit out of your body and suck it up into some magical heaven. It's not going to happen. Another man, M-A-N, human being, wrote that. Not the creator of the universe. Not the creator of the universe. And as I said before, my disclaimer, I believe that there's a God. I believe that there's a creator of the universe. This ain't it. <laughs> the Gnostics knew. When was hell added to the Bible? Oh, what do you mean? Hell was added to the Bible? What is he talking about? The lake of fire, the burning lake of fire, the eternal burning and suffering. Purgatory. I'm going to go there if I don't do this. That's why I got to pretend like I love this stuff so I don't end up in this lake of fire. The fear is driving me to do this religion. The mission is to bring heaven to earth. You missed that message, didn't you? The mission, is, the mission is to do greater things than he. You missed that message, didn't you? You're supposed to even excel and exceed far past what Yeshua's achievements were on this planet, not in any kind of magical heaven, right here on this physical plane of existence. You're supposed to bring heaven to earth. Can you master that right here? Can you love your brother? Can you stop falling for divide and conquer? Can you get the hell out of poly tricks? Can you stop falling for the foolishness and go take a word, a, a, a trip towards spirituality and visit inner space so you can expand the outer space and find out who you truly are and the power that's truly inside of you and find out that you are God walking in the flesh every single day? Because the same divine spark that created this universe is inside of your body. Who is doing all of the killing in the Bible? And you know what I found out during my research into that topic? It wasn't the devil. <laughs> God had killed over three million people in the Bible, including his own son. <laughs> the devil didn't kill anybody. <laughs> this is crazy. He had killed over three million plus his own son. And the devil didn't kill anybody. That's crazy.
Like, think about that for a minute. Who was doing all the killing? But then I came across this verse. Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I doeth these things, saith the Lord. That's God speaking. It's some of the most ridiculous stuff that I've ever heard. And I've read over a thousand books, scriptures, papyrus, cylinder scrolls, and texts from all around the world. And when I go into here, it's like I'm, le I'm reading a comedy show. I'm literally reading a comedy show. Now, is there good stuff in the Bible? Yes. There is good information in this book. The problem is the average person can't separate the good from the bad. They have no real discernment. So they lump it all together. And because they can't really understand what's in it in the first place, they have no clue where to even go. So that's why they go to the building that's called a church or a kingdom hall or whatever you want to go, a temple. And they listen to somebody spew at them propaganda for two, three hours. And then they give them all their money and they go out and they're going, whoo, I feel so much better. I might, I might make it to heaven now. I got a slight pop. I'm, I'm about right here, but if I do a little bit more, I might get to right here. And then I'm thinking I might, right before I die, if I could just say those last, utter those last words right at the last second, I just might slip right on in. Well, God through Jesus tells, says to the other disciples that there's a devil amongst us and he's going to slip into Judas and he's going to blah, 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 blah. And this, you know, Judas turns him into the money changers and so forth and so on and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden he sold him out and now they're coming to grab him. A lot of people haven't even read the book of Judas. Eh, I'd recommend it. It's a it's an apocrypha text, and it's a little bit different than what you've been told in history. <laughs> they left that out of the Bible by accident on purpose. They didn't want you to read that either. Nobody read the book of Jesus' wife? Did you read that book yet? Oh, yeah, the book of Jesus. It's at the Harvard Seminary. What did he go to Egypt for with his mom? To learn the Egyptian mysteries. He became an adept initiate of what? Thoth, the Atlantean priest king that authored the Emerald Tablets, who ruled over the land of Kemet for 16,000 years, one man by himself. That's what he went there for. And then after he left uh, Egypt, he ended up in um, Tibet to learn Qigong and Reiki and all those arts, healing arts with his hands and moving energy through his body. Most likely with the monks. That has been confirmed by the Dalai Lama. Then he ended up down into India to learn the mystic arts, teaching reincarnation all the way back into Egypt. <clears throat> you can find that information in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Again, not in the Bible. Then he appears back in the Bible at the age of 32, riding on the back of a donkey. I called my son out of Egypt, the Bible says. Oh, I called my son out of Egypt. Yeah, hey, man, you're done over there. Come on back over here now. We got to put you back in this story now because, you know, you did your thing over there. Hey, it's all good. You got the knowledge? Okay, come back on over here because now we're about to proclaim you to be the king. And then we're going to slice your head off and jab you and be put you on a cross and nail you to a cross and stab you in the stomach and take your blood and all that. You know, we're going to do that to you next. So come on back over here because we got to finish this story. Satan, what is he guilty of? Being petty. <laughs> Satan is just petty. He's just petty. I remember Jesus was out in the wilderness, right? <laughs> For 40 days and 40 nights. And, and, and the devil's like tempting him. You know, I'll give you the world and, and I'll do this and I'll do that. And he wait till Jesus get like real hungry and real like, real like exhausted and, and thirsty for water. And he's really, really hungry. And that's probably like the 30th or so day in. And he's like, hey, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you turn this rock into bread? <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, the highest level of what you see going on there. I mean, this guy's like literally not riding around slicing people open. When the angels of God literally come down on the ground, put on military gear. This is in the Bible. I read this in my in my uh, other video, Book of Deuteronomy. Get get weapons of war out to go to a battle with humans to go fight against people that they don't even know because God wants that land. And God said, one person over there, um, you know, has cursed my name or doesn't believe in me. So take down the entire town, the entire city, kill the women, kill the children, kill the babies. 
and bring me back the spoils of war. What kind of God needs a spoils of war? What is going up that God needs spoils of war? What would that do for a God? Like, if I'm a God and I'm creating everything, then your petty little, quote unquote, ideology of what war and money and exchanges are <clears throat> doesn't even exist in my brain. It's like, y'all, y'all just ants to me. Like, you know, what you're going to give that to me? Like, what am I going to do with it? I can create whatever I want by thought. So why would I need your spoils of war? Why would I need you to go fight a war for me because I'm pissed off at what somebody else said about me or what somebody else ain't doing to worship me the way I want to be worshipped? Because as the Bible says, I'm a jealous God. Well, why is God jealous? Why is something that's supposed to be so divine and all loving and all knowing also now jealous? There'll be no other gods but me. Why? Well, why is that? That's more contradiction. Well, what other gods are there that exist other than me if there's other gods? Oh, I get it. You're talking about, you know, saying that, you know, idols and this and that, you know. Actually, when you look at the translation of the biblical text into its original form, you discover that the word God is mistranslated. Everywhere where you see God singular, it's supposed to be gods with an S, plural. But the S was dropped off by accident on purpose to usher in a monotheistic mindset of biblical texts. So you can think that there really is only one God. It's only one God. We got the right. We just, Out of all the religions, we just happen to be in the right one. This is the one. We made it. We're going to heaven. I just got to do this, 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 and this, and act like this, 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 and this. I must not have been good enough somewhere else in my life. I got, I got struck down with this disease now because I didn't. I thought if I prayed over this food, it was going to be good to go. But it, somehow it still killed me anyway. <laughs> the Bible came as God spoke the universe into existence, and it took him seven days. Then he rested all these human physical acts. Why not God need to rest if he's all-powerful? An all-powerful, all-knowing God, why would he need to rest? Again, he as well. Why is it always a he? Because I'll tell you why. A man wrote this. Now, where did this text come from? You've heard me say it many, many times. The Bible is a remix of a lot of texts. A lot of books that I have right here in my own house, in my own library. I've done a video called uh, The Forbidden Book List. It's on Forbidden Knowledge TV. You can go check that out. I think I went through about 400 books in three hours that night. That was only like, I don't know, a third of the books I have in here. But anyway... We're talking about the Old Testament coming out of the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tabs of Creation, the Epic of Atrahasis. We're talking about the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Indian Vedas. Uh, we're talking about the Myth of Adapa, the Code of Hammurabi, um, the uh, 42 Laws of Mayat, um, I mean, the, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is actually the Egyptian Book of Going Forth by Day. I mean, I can go on and on and on. <clears throat> You know, you're talking about taking a lot of different scripts and a lot of different writings and teachings and compiling them together. This is what the Council of Nicaea did. Then they sorted through them all and they kind of curated it and they figured out what they were going to keep out and what they were going to what they were going to leave out, what they were going to keep. And when they came up with an idea of what they were actually going to keep and what they were going to leave out, then they began to remix it. This is this is just I hope you guys are getting I hope you guys are beginning to get an understanding of the dogma that you've been that you've fallen prey to. And I do mean fallen prey. You've been a victim. You've been victimized. You've been you've been targeted since birth. And it's unfortunate you've been targeted since birth, but you've been targeted since birth. Like I always say, when you were born, you were given a name, a race, and a religion, and you spend the rest of your life defending a false identity. You don't even know who you are. You have no clue who you really are. You haven't spent any time even looking into who you really are. Hence, you walk around as a soulless avatar operating on matrix programming code. You literally live by the programming. The programming that's coming from the outside in, from your parents, your friends, the TV, your teacher, society, and then from the internal programming, from your hormones, the way they respond to your environment on the outside. And so your hormones are carrying codes throughout the body and you're just living on those codes. So you got codes on the inside and codes on the outside. And your thoughts are completely connected to yourself. So you don't have any separation from your own thoughts. So you're just a robot walking around, living one bit at a time, a B-I-T, zeros and ones, walking on the code, 
not ever knowing that you can hack the code, you can change the code, you can reprogram the code. You haven't even separated yourself from your own thoughts. You're the observer of your thoughts. You're not your thoughts, but you don't know that yet. And so you're walking around thinking you're an individual and you're somebody special. And you're just a program robot walking around the streets, <clears throat> carrying information to and fro, never really truly, no truly knowing the power that's inside of your body and who you truly are.